Well, good evening. We are going to continue our study tonight on the tab the tabernacle. And if you want to find the book of Exodus, we're not going to start with a reading before. We'll get to some here in just a minute. We're going to turn to several different passages, and you're welcome to follow along with me as we do so. It may take me a little bit longer to get there than you, <laughs> even though I know what they are ahead of time, but uh, I will get there eventually, all right? But uh, anyways, we're going to continue our study tonight, and we're going to look at uh, our third lesson, uh, just entitled My House. And of course, uh, this whole study has been about the tabernacle, and we'll continue that, and we need to understand God was the architect. We saw that last week. God was the divine blueprinter. It was his plan for all this, and uh, and it is his place where he met with God's people. And uh, throughout the study, you'll see that uh, Moses has been instructed to build this structure called the tabernacle. And tonight, I want to kind of maybe do something uh, maybe a little different when you think about the tabernacle. Maybe you don't think about this, but I want to give you the, uh, some things tonight. There's actually seven names for the tabernacle. Uh, it's not always just referred to as the tabernacle, and there's actually seven names given to this structure, and of course each name has a little bit of a different uh, thought process for us as believers, you know, of course, of course pointing uh, towards Jesus Christ and picturing him. And uh, so the names given to the tabernacle, we'll kind of see as we go through them this evening, uh, they reveal first of all the importance of the tabernacle to the Israelites. This is a hu huge thing for them, this is a very important structure for them obviously, uh, but as we look at kind of uh, how it affects us or what things that we can see for us, we'll also see some very important things, I think, uh, in our relationship with Christ and his relationship with us and uh, his love for the church and so on and so forth. So, uh, so as we look at that, we'll get into our outline. And again, we'll go to several scripture references just to kind of bring out uh, some of the things that we're saying uh, in these points. So uh, let's start with this, and we'll give you the first name here I want to cover tonight, and that is Tent. Tent. How many of you have ever been to church under a tent? Yeah, isn't that exciting? I've, I've always enjoyed it. I always thought it was really neat and really cool. And uh, tent revivals and tent meetings and all those types of things, a really neat thing. But one of the words used in Scripture uh, for the tabernacle many times is referred to as the tent. If you take your Bibles again, if you want to follow along, Exodus chapter number 39. Uh, and we'll be right in Exodus for a little while. And again, I'll have you turn to a couple of those if you want to follow along. But Exodus chapter 39 and verse number 33. And they brought the tabernacle unto Moses, the tent. Uh, and all his furniture, his, his tacks, his boards, his bars, his pillars, and sockets. You skip down that same chapter to verse number 40. And it talks about some of the other things within the tabernacle. The hangings of the court, his pillars, his sockets, the hanging of the front court, or, or the court gate, his cords, his pins, and the vessels of the service of the tabernacle for the tent of the congregation. So once again, you see it referred to as a tent. There's, there's other passages as well. Uh, a tent, if you think about it, is, is kind of, it's not much, really. Uh, you go camping in the woods in a tent. Now, I know some of you guys are probably glampers, aren't you? And uh, when you camp, you've got to have the camper with the refrigerator and the stove and the, uh, the uh, heated, heated uh, bed inside and the recliner and the TV, right? Uh, that's not camping, <laughs> all right? But uh, <laughs> what's that? It, that's right, and park on pavement and have, a, have your satellite, you know, and all that. But uh, <laughs> when, you, when you really think of camping in the rawest form, okay, you think of pitching a tent, right? It ain't much protection, all right? It's an outer covering. And, and when we refer to the tabernacle as, as the tent, that's kind of what you think of. Uh, it's just the outer covering. It's movable. Uh, it's movable and an outer covering, I think, because it's really suggesting uh, to Israel the fact of their pilgrimage. Uh, they're not staying in one place. They're, they're heading towards the promised land. Uh, it was a temporary dwelling place for Christ. It was a temporary meeting place for them. Uh, a permanent one would come down the road, but this was temporary. Uh, you know, I thought about that, and I couldn't help but think, and again, I know I'm a little odd. We all agree on that fact. But uh, uh, when you think of church, <laughs> church, if you really think about it, it's not the building. It's, it's the people, okay? We, we, we're the church, all right? And, and if you really think about that, we've been on a pilgrimage most of our lives, have we not? And, of course, it won't end until we get to heaven, but think of all the different places you've lived. 
Think about all the different places you've vacationed. Uh, think about the churches that you visited here and there. Aren't you glad there was a tent, if you will, uh, for you to meet the Lord wherever you were and, and all along life's pathway? Uh, so it, it was a temporary stru- structure, a dwelling place, the outer uh, uh, covering, if you will. Uh, so as you think about the tent, let me give you a couple of thoughts. First of all, God intended the tabernacle to be temporary. Uh, this was not going to be the permanent place of worship because they were not in a permanent location. Um, it could be set up and taken down whenever he wanted the people uh, of the camp to stop moving or to start moving. They had the instructions to set up the tabernacle to take the tabernacle down. Uh, as you think about that, it, it gives us pretty clear indication today. Uh, we're not taking the church up and down. Thank God. Amen. <laughs> you, ever, you ever been part of starting a church where you rented a little storefront and you had to set up chairs every day, take down chairs every day, you set out signs every day, take that. You, in about three weeks in, you're like, I'm done with this. Let's get a building, right? Uh, God never intended that the tabernacle to be, the, the, his tent or his tabernacle to be permanent, okay? Uh, it, it was always temporary, but they were told when to take it down, when to put it up. Amen. And it's just kind of a clear indication to me today, even though we're not in a tent per se, it, it's an indication that we're supposed to just follow his directions, right? He tells us when to go, he tells us when to stop. He tells us when to push on. He tells us when to lay off. Uh, he tells us how far to go. He tells us all that. And, of course, we have to just be obedient uh, and be willing to follow those directions. Uh, secondly, it was temporary because they lived in the wilderness. Uh, there was no use building a permanent structure. Besides that, uh, I'm sure they didn't own the land, right? So it's kind of hard to, to, to take a plot and build something. Um, God wanted them to keep moving. They weren't to stay in the wilderness. That was never his intention. He had given them something called the promised land. And, and you know, you, you, you see this throughout the pages of Scripture. This was promised to Israel, I've got a land for you. So that's part of the reason it was temporary. If they built a permanent structure, they would feel like staying. And God said, I don't want you to stay. I've got a place for you to go. You know, I thought about that and I couldn't help but think, is not God's plan always better than ours? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm planning this and God says, well, you can plan it all you want to, but that's not what I'm going to do, Right? And many times we question and we wonder, we're like, well, that's not what... He knows what he's doing and he knows what's best. <laughs> and again, just like following directions, it's good just to trust him, whatever he leads us into doing. Uh, so it was temporary because they were heading to a better place, all right? And if you think about it, even though we have a permanent structure here, this is still a temporary meeting place. Uh, we're headed to a better place as well. We've got a land that's been promised to us, amen? And I know most of you that I've talked to are looking forward to getting there soon, Amen. And uh, thankful for that place. So uh, I put down a third thought here. More than just the church being a temporary meeting place for us, the believer's body is temporary. Uh, The body is like a tent, okay? It's a temporary dwelling place. Uh, Heaven is our permanent dwelling place, okay? We're here. We're enduring. We're surviving. We're making the best of what we can. We're living for Christ. We're trying to flourish. We're trying to be the light of the world, right? But this is temporary, okay? This isn't our final, sp- uh, final resting place. This isn't our final home. Something much better is awaiting us as well. So even the body can be referred to as a tent. Uh, the last thing I'll, I'll give you reference to here is this. The word tent uh, was also used to refer to the tabernacle as a meeting place where God met with man. And again, it was a temporary place. Okay, This wasn't a permanent thing, so just remember that. But it was a temporary place where God w- w- would meet with man. If you go back in Exodus to chapter number uh, 25... And you look at verse 22. God is talking, of course, telling Moses about the tabernacle and all types of things. He says this in verse 22. And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. So, so God is even kind of reminding Moses as he's given instructions on how does he say, I'll meet you there. It's It's temporary. Uh, but, but, uh, but that's a place where I'm going to meet you. So even as referring to as a tent, a temporary place, it was still a place where God was going to meet them. So that was the first word, is tent. Look at the second one. Uh, the second word we have referring to the tabernacle, God's house, is sanctuary. Sanctuary. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, right? Uh, a sanctuary. This is another name giving, given to the tabernacle. This is found as well in Exodus chapter 25. We just read verse 22. But if you look at verse number 8, it says, Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. What do you think about when you, when you hear the word sanctuary? Safe? Okay. What else? 
secure, comfortable. What's that? A gathering place, okay. Protected. Those all those are all good, boy. Good job. You got God's promise he'd be there. You guys are like walking the sources. Good job. Somebody else? Yeah, <laughs> that's what you're not allowed to do in the sanctuary, right? <laughs> um, okay, so, so you know what, you think of sanctuary, I, I, one of the first things that comes to my mind is, you know, they have all these bird sanctuaries, you know, and you go and all these protected birds are there and they're beautiful and you can walk through them, but you know, don't, don't, don't harm anything and some of them don't touch anything. Uh, when, I was, when we were on our cruise for our 25th anniversary, we went to a, a bird sanctuary and we went to a, a monkey sanctuary. And uh, I've got some really good, good pictures of, of those things. But it was a safe place for them. That's, that's where they abode. That's where they dwell. That's where they lived. And you could go through and walk through and, you know, check out those things. But it was their space, okay? And it was a safe space for them. Sanctuary. I, I thought about the sanctuary. I'll give you a couple of thoughts here that I put down. First of all, this was a place that was set apart for the dwelling of God among his people. This was not just a, a, a typical building. This was not just, hey, let's come, let's come and you know, hang out and have some fun. This was a place set apart. By the way, are, are we not as believers told that we are set apart? <laughs> okay. Uh, so you see the correlation even to the, to the believer in Christ. A place that was set apart. Exodus chapter number um, 29. And, and scripture says this in verse uh, uh, 40, 44. And I will sanctify the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar. I will sanctify also both Aaron and his sons to minister to me in the priest's office. And I will dwell among the children of Israel and will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God and brought them forth out of the land of Egypt that I may dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. And so you see him using that, that, that terminology towards sanctuary even in those verses there and referring to what he did. So it was set apart for God's dwelling place. This wasn't a place for Israel to meet you know, and play checkers. Okay. It wasn't a place for Israel to meet and have, you know, a family get together. This was a place where God said, I have set it apart for a reason. That reason is for me to come and meet you and dwell there amongst you and fellowship and, and learn and you worship me. Uh, secondly, in a sense, the local church is God's sanctuary. Uh, today, Ephesians chapter 1 talks about how Christ is the head of the church, right? Uh, and, and, of course, we're just the body and many members make up that body, but he's, he's the body. This is God's sanctuary. If you think about it, the church ought to be a place where people can come and feel safe. And I'm, not, I'm not talking necessarily even physically, although we hope that's true too, right? But we ought to be able to come and feel protected, feel safe, feel loved, uh, feel uh, not judged but accepted and, 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 and uh, edified and encouraged. That ought to be the place that we go. That ought to be church. And so the local church today, it's kind of that same terminology, even one used for the tabernacle back in these days, the sanctuary. Number, letter C, number C, number C, letter four. The Christian is a sanctuary where the Holy Spirit lives. First Corinthians chapter six, what does it say? Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. You are not your own. You are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your soul, which are his. All right. So even even our life points to back, wait, the tabernacle. Okay, because it came way before us, other than Roger, um, <laughs> it came way before us. The tabernacle then even points to the fact of what we experience today. As a Christian, my my life, my body is a sanctuary for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God. And I don't know about you, but I'm glad that when I got saved, the Holy Spirit took up residence. Amen. <laughs> And the comforter came, and I'm so thankful for that. And uh, we need to make sure we live our lives out accordingly, remembering and reminding ourselves daily and often, whatever I do, the Holy Spirit's there, <laughs> okay? And, and I'm representative of Him, and uh, so remember that. So sanctuary is the second word used uh, for His house. The third one, and of course, we, we've already referred to this, we've been referring to it as this, but tabernacle. Uh, tabernacle. The word tabernacle and as, as, as it's taught through Exodus and Leviticus even, um, it really emphasizes, once again, the dwelling of God amongst men. The dwelling of God amongst men. Um, in Leviticus chapter 1, verse number 1, uh, this is the dwelling place that God spoke to Moses from. Okay? Now, there's a difference between a dwelling place and a, and a place that you visit. Does that make sense? Now, again, it's a temporary structure, 
It's traveling through the wilderness as they're heading to the promised land, but God's presence was permanent. Does that make sense? And so that's really the emphasis of tabernacle. It's God is there to meet us. He dwells here. He lives us, or He lives here. He, we worship Him here. We fellowship with Him here. He's here, okay? He's in our presence. And so that's the significance of, of, of the tabernacle being just a little bit different even than the other couple words we've mentioned. It really emphasizes His dwelling. Um, now, I thought about that, and again, I'm going to give you some thoughts for us today, okay? Uh, first of all, God abides in believers. God abides in believers. John chapter 14, verse 23, talks about how God and Jesus make their abode in us. What's it mean to abide? To live. That's like a constant thing, Right? I don't abide with my in-laws. Hallelujah. Praise King Jesus. All right. I'll visit them occasionally and they'll visit me occasionally, but I don't abide with them. Okay. God wants the abiding relationship. And of course, he, he started proving that and showing that with the tabernacle. And he continues to teach that, throw that, show that through his word. And we continue to learn that today. He wants that relationship. He wants that abiding uh, Ephesians chapter 3, uh, verse number 17, it says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. He, 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 now, he's there if you're saved, okay? He's there, nothing you can do about it. But, but again, dwelling and visiting are two different things. He wants to abide with us. And that's the significance of the tabernacle versus a tent or a sanctuary. Although it's still a temporary structure, it emphasizes and reinforces the permanence of, sa- of our Savior. Uh, our, our body is a temple. He goes with us everywhere we go, does he not? It's temporary too, yeah. But yet he dwells in his presence and never leaves us. I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. And so you see that correlation there. Someday, let her be, uh, he will dwell in our presence physically, <laughs> okay? Uh, Revelation, of course, talks much about that. Uh, one day we're going to go home, amen? And uh, we're going to go to a better place. The promised land's awaiting, and we'll get to actually dwell in his presence face to face, see the Savior that died for us. It made all that possible. And uh, so, again, that importance of dwelling. Um, God dwelt in the, in the, in the uh, temporary structure, but he dwelt permanently. He dwells in our lives permanently. And if you ever don't feel his presence, let me just say this. It's not him that walked away. <laughs> if I ever don't feel his presence and his closeness, it's not him that's behind, you know, hiding somewhere, okay? It's me. <laughs> it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer, right? It's me. My fault. I need to get some things right. And so his, his permanent dwelling in our lives is pictured by that word tabernacle. Uh, let me give you the fourth one. I think we're on number four, aren't we? Yes. It's cruising right along. Number four, the tabernacle of the congregation. A different phrase is used in Exodus chapter 39. Uh, we saw tent in Exodus 39. But in Exodus 39 verse 32 it says this, Thus was all the work of the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation finished. And the children of Israel did according to all the Lord commanded Moses, so did they. The tabernacle of the congregation. Now, did it really belong to them? Well, kind of. I mean, it was their stuff, but they gave it to God. It was God's place. It was God's house. So when it says of the congregation... I started to kind of think, what, is that, what does that mean? And, and I didn't really place a lot of emphasis on the of. What I placed the emphasis on, on was the congregation. Um, there, there, was, there was only one congregation that the Lord was coming to meet with. Does that make sense? He wasn't meeting all over the place with a bunch of different people. He said, there's, there's a congregation. It's my people. It's my house. I'll meet there in the tabernacle of the congregation. There were no divisions. Okay, you didn't have the first Baptist church of Israel and the second Baptist church of Israel. All right. And the missionary Baptist church of Israel and the American Baptist church of Israel and the first Pentecostal church of Israel and and the assembly of God of Israel. (laughs) Okay. And and the first Lutheran church of Israel. You didn't have any of that stuff. Okay. It was one congregation where God met, God dwelt with, God fellowship with. They worshiped God. They sacrificed. They praised God. One congregation. You know, I, I, again, I'll give you a couple of thoughts about this. Of course, it refers to our church today, really. The local church is referred to as the body of Christ. It's the body of Christ. Uh, in Matthew chapter 16, in verse number 18, uh, Jesus and Peter are having a discussion. And a phrase is used there, and, and he's talking to Peter, and he says, Upon this rock, I will build my church. 
most people, not most people, but a lot of people today say, well, that was, he was talking about Peter, and Peter was the first pope of the church and started all that. He's, he's saying this, he said, upon this rock, referring back to the verse before, which is that Jesus is the Son of God, okay? And upon that foundation will the church be built, okay? Jesus is the founder, the funder, the financer, the, you name it, of the church, okay? <laughs> it's his place. And we're just simply the body that he uses, the body of Christ. Uh, 1 Corinthians, of course, in chapter 12 talks about how uh, many members, different functions, but we all make up one body body of Christ. Um, and it, it, it talks about that in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Almost the whole chapter, really, is, is referring to those types of things. So as you think about the local church being Christ's body, the second thing I put down was this. God doesn't want division in the congregation. Now, I will say this. 1 Corinthians 12. It talks about having no schism. No schism. All having the same care for each other, okay? That's what, that's what verse 25 talks about. That, let me just let me kind of clarify, okay? That does not mean the church is going to be perfect. That does not mean you're going to agree with every single person and every single thing the church does. Because we're all different. And we all come from different backgrounds. Uh, and, and all those, you know, well, we're all human, okay? And, and so it doesn't mean the church is perfect. It doesn't mean there should never be discussion about something. It doesn't mean the preacher says, well, I said and that goes and you can't question it. If you go to that kind of church, it's probably time to pack your bags and leave, okay? Um, because that's not what God intended either, all right? Uh, but God doesn't want fighting. He doesn't want division. See, even when there's differences or disagreements within the church, those things can still be handled properly within the church setting. And we need to remember that this isn't our place. It's His. And if we're going to be the best representatives for Him and reach people for Him, even the problems that we might face or the disagreements or the, hey, what do you, they need to be handled properly. God's intention is not for the church to fight. You ever been to a church and you walked in and said, Something, something's not right here. You been there? Huh? <laughs> you been a part of a church and some big old fight broke out and you're like, Whoa, what's happening? You know, next Sunday, half the church wasn't there. You know, it's, it's a sad, sad situation. Now, unfortunately, those things happen because we are human. But as a church, and remembering we're the body of Christ, and, and we're the tabernacle, if you will, we need to remember it's his place. We need to handle things accordingly. Uh, avoid, the, avoid the division. Uh, third, I put this down. No place in Scripture, this is a term you might hear today, does God refer to the universal church. Okay? Um, there, there are a lot of people today who say, well, because I'm saved... We're all part of this universal body, and I don't need to do anything for Christ. You're, you're missing out on a whole bunch of the Christian life, if that's your thought. Okay, You're missing out on clear-cut commands of Christ, opportunities to serve Christ, and all those types of things. When we think, well, I'm part of the big, big, bull body, universal body of Christ. Okay, There's no mention to that. The Lord is going to... Uh, uh, let me put it this way. When Christ returns... Now, we say this, and we use this phrase sometimes. He's not going to call the church away. He's going to call the church, the body of Christ, away. He's going to call us away, believers. Uh, now, one day in heaven, guess what's going to happen with all those believers? Every kindred, every tongue, every tribe are going to get together. We're going to form one big giant church in heaven, amen? And we're going to praise him, and we're going to sing, and we're going to worship, and we're going to love. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12 talks a little bit about that. Uh, and we're going to enjoy that then, but it's not now. And so the church body that God has you a part of, can I just say this, not even coming from a pastor, but just as a Christian, let's do the best we can in the church that we're in to promote the cause of Christ. Because we only have a short amount of time to do it. And uh, we want the world to have the best taste in their mouth, if you will, for what the church is and represents. Uh, so the tabernacle of the congregation. Let me give you number five. Number five. We're going to be out of here early tonight. Are you happy? If you're happy, say Amen. <laughs> if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. Stop. Tabernacle of the Lord. <laughs> the tabernacle of the Lord. Again, and I know some of this is kind of repetitive when you really think about it. But again, it's just that emphasis that this is God's place. This is where God dwells. It was not, it, it's not just simply a place they went to worship, although they did. It's a place where they experienced a meeting with God. First uh, Kings chapter two. I'm going to turn there for you. First Kings chapter two. 
And I'm going to read uh, verse number uh, 28, if I can find it. It's right before 2 Kings. 1 Kings 2, <laughs> verse 28. Uh, then tidings came to Joab, for Joab had turned after Adonijah, though he had turned not after Absalom. And Joab fled unto the tabernacle of the Lord and caught hold on the horns of the altar. Uh, the tabernacle of the Lord. This was a place where, man, you didn't just say, well, I'm going to church. How many, I know this is a Wednesday night crowd, so I'm preaching to the choir, okay? How many Christians go to church to check it off their to-do list? There's a lot. Well, I'm supposed to go, so I went, I, I, I went and sat there for my hour and a half Sunday mornings, and I sang, and I listened. I'm going home. See you in a week. Check it off. And if you think about it, the tabernacle that God prepared and planned was not just so that they could come and worship. He wanted to dwell with them. <laughs> he wanted that, that, that relationship, that fellowship. The presence of the tabernacle meant that the Lord himself was among the people. Uh, what, what does scripture say? Where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm there. You know, if, if you come to church and you can't feel the presence of the Lord once again, you're probably in the wrong church. <laughs> you know, we, we ought to be able to feel the presence of the Lord. Feel Him working. Uh, feel Him moving. Feel Him speaking. See His miraculous, uh, wonderful ability at work in our lives and in our church. Uh, this, this, the presence of this tabernacle of the Lord, uh, it, it meant that God Himself, would dwell amongst them. Now I want you to think about that for just a minute. Think about who God is. <laughs> think about it. The great I am. Creator, the Alpha and Omega. Beginning and the end. And he said this. I want you to build this. Yeah, it's a lot of work. Yeah, you got to haul it all. Yeah, you got to set it up and take it down. And set it up and take it down. And set it up and take it down. But it's for me. <laughs> am I not worthy? You know. Think about that. And they did this on a consistent basis because they enjoyed and wanted that fellowship with the Lord because he dwelt there. Boy, I feel bad for some Christians today who just sh sh shirk off and slough off. I don't need to go to church. I don't care about things. And it's like we get to experience the presence of God, the one who created us and sent his son to die for us. That's the importance of that relationship. And some kind of, yeah. imagine if Israel, half the tribe said, I ain't going to do my job this week. I don't feel like it. Right? I don't, I don't want to worship this week. Somebody else said. Every tribe had a specific duty. Every tribe had a specific uh, timing. They, of course, they, I'm sure they had it down to a science after so long. Uh, when to set up, when to take down, how to do it exactly the way God wanted them to do it. What happened? They just said, I don't really want to do it today. They didn't do it. Why? Because they enjoyed the presence of the Lord. It was the meeting place for the Lord. Thinking about that, this is a comfort, was it not? Israel knew. Uh, boy, when we've got burdens, we can go to the Lord. Boy, when we need, when we need forgiveness, <laughs> we can meet the Lord. When we just want to worship and praise because how awesome he is, we can go to the Lord. This is comforting. Joshua chapter 1 and uh, verse number 9. I'm going to turn it here there real quick, okay? Give me just a second. Don't judge me. We, we often quote Joshua 1.8, right? This book of the law. Okay, uh, it talks about that's the only verse, the verse in the Bible that has uh, success. You know, I shall find the ways prosperous, and I shall have good success when you meditate on the Word of God. You know, verse 9 says, Jesus is talking to Joshua. Here's what he says Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. You know, when you face a trial or a burden or a heartache or a problem or a bad circumstance, like, isn't it nice to know that God is there with you? That's comforting to us, is it not? And you're having a physical problem, a surgery's coming up, whatever it may be, uh, and somebody's there to, to spend time with you and to remind you of the goodness of God, to pray with you, share scripture with you, whatever, and it's comforting. So this, this, even though it's a temporary situation for Israel, they were able to, every time they set up that tabernacle, draw comfort in the fact that God was there. God was there. Now, aren't you glad we don't have to set up and tear down every week? I am. And isn't it nice to know that every day, as soon as you get up, God is with you. And when you go to bed, God is with you. And when you're sleeping through the night, God is with you. And when you hear the creaky noises in the middle of the night, and you wake up, oh, what is that? God is with you. Amen. And when you see the rattlesnake in the front yard, God is with you. And although it's his creation, he expects you to kill it and kill it dead and kill it dead a second time. Amen. 
Amen. <laughs> hey, he, he, he cursed the, gar- the snake in the garden. I think it still applies today. Amen. He's with us. <laughs> this is, that's a great comfort. I don't know about you. There, I have burdens in my life often. And I face situations like our Sunday night series we just finished up that seem impossible to me. And it's nice to know that God is right there holding my hand or carrying me even, amen, through that situation. What a comfort it is to know his dwelling is with us. Let me give you this thought, though. It's good to dwell in his comfort, but it's also a warning. They could not escape the presence of the Lord. Moms, you remember when you had three toddlers? And they all wanted something at the same time. Mom, 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 can I, mom, can I, mom, will you, mom, will, 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 will. And you wake up in the morning and they never stop. And, and you said, I got to get away from them. And you go lock yourself in the bathroom just to get away from them. You don't have to go to the bathroom. You just said, if I go in the bathroom, maybe. And then they're pounding on the bathroom door. Can I, come here? can I? Right? You just say, I just want to get away for a minute, right? <laughs> Leave me a, give me five mommy minutes. Do you realize that as often as we may have tried to hide from our kids, whether we're successful or not, you know one of the greatest things you do with your kids is play hide and seek, and you find a really good one and don't ever come out all day. <laughs> Let them look. But anyway, they'll get hungry eventually. But anyways, there's, <laughs> there's no hiding from the presence of the Lord. So although we draw great comfort in knowing his presence is always with us, sometimes that also brings great conviction, does it not? Because that means when I choose to do something stupid... And something I shouldn't do, and, and choose to give in to temptation here or there, he's also there for that. And he sees that. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. And so it's a warning as well as a comfort. And I think Israel realized that as well. Uh, the last thing I just put down is just kind of a reminder, kind of go with letter C there. The Christian cannot escape the presence of the Lord either. Galatians chapter 2 says, uh, it talks about how I die with Christ, but it says, uh, nevertheless I live. And it says, Christ liveth in me. Christ liveth in me. Um, you can't get rid of him. <laughs> you can't escape him. And so the tabernacle of the Lord just kind of reminds us that he's always present. That's comforting. It's convicting as well. Uh, but boy, if we live the life he wants us to live, it's a wonderful, wonderful journey, is it not? The tabernacle of the Lord. Let me give you the next one, number six here. I said we we're going to be finished early. I better hurry. Number six, the tabernacle of testimony. Tabernacle of testimony. Within the Ark of the Covenant, which was placed where? In the Holy of Holies. Very good. There were three things. I'm not giving prizes away. I'll give you a, hey, good job. Okay, what were the three things in the Ark of the Covenant? Shout them out. Ten Commandments. Aaron's Rod. Pot of manna. Very good. Very good. Good job, guys. You listened in Sunday school or junior church or or you read your Bible, one or the other. But anyways, those three things were there. Um, Each one of those signify something. It's a testimony of something. And so I want to look at that. Um, It's a testimony, and I'll break it down here in a second, but it's a testimony of the holiness of God, uh, our need to approach Him in the right way, and and the power of God that never ends, Okay. And so look at these thoughts. Uh, First of all, the Ten Commandments were in there. This was a testimony of God's righteous standards. Now, I put in there, shortened shortened phrase here. My my notes say, uh, these standards are not to be lowered. Now, we often think about the Ten Commandments. A lot of people think, well, I'm going to heaven because I obey the Ten Commandments. And really, probably we, if we're honest with ourselves, we probably struggle with a few even if we say we don't, okay? Uh, the Ten Commandments, okay? This was God's righteousness. Here's my standards. And, and the problem we have today in our world is this. The world likes to twist and change and make those standard, standards convenient for how they're living. Do they not? How many times do people try to make the Bible fit their life? And that's not the way it works. <laughs> I'm supposed to conform my life to the Bible, <laughs> And so the standards that God presented, it's a testimony of his holiness and his righteous standard. And, and those are not to be toyed with. They're not to be lowered. The second thing was Aaron's rod. That was a testimony of the Christian 
reflecting the righteousness of the standards of God. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 and 14 tells us as Christians that we are the salt and we are the light. What is that? That's us reflecting God's standards at work in our life. I'm not the salt and the life because I'm a good person. I'm not a good person, especially by nature. I'm a wicked, evil, filthy, rotten, stinking sinner by nature. But because of what Christ's work has done in me, I can reflect God's standards in my life because Christ has changed me, and that's when I can be salt and light. I reflect that. I reflect that. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 reminds us that we are ambassadors of Christ. And we're supposed to help others be reconciled to Him. It's hard to bring other people to the Savior if my life doesn't represent the Savior. Right? And so Aaron's rod is a testimony of that. Hey, God's giving His righteous standards in the Ten Commandments. Aaron's rod now says, now you, you go and show those. You go and live those. You go and display those. And then there's the pot of manna. A testimony of how God's power continually and everlastingly, if that's a word, sustains the believer. Sustains the believer. John chapter 6, verse 41, Jesus said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. Pharisees didn't want to hear that. They got mad at him for saying that. But is he not the bread of life? And just like the manna never ran out in the wilderness, his power will never run out. His, his ability to work in our lives will never run out. Uh, we serve that God tonight. Uh, so that's a tabernacle of testimony. And then give you the last one, uh, letter or le- number, 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 letter, whatever it is. <laughs> Seven, the tabernacle of witness. The tabernacle of witness. Numbers chapter 17 it refers to this. Um, when the tabernacle was first structured and, and, and put together and they started traveling with it, um, Moses brought uh, rods from various tribes. And he placed them in the tabernacle to verify which tribe was chosen uh, to represent God to others. Of course, the, the rod that stood out by God to Moses, first off and overall, was Aaron's rod. And that kind of took precedence. But when you think about the tabernacle of witness, let me give you a couple of thoughts. Aaron's rod, God told Moses to keep that out uh, in the tabernacle. Keep it out, is a witness that he had been given authority by God. He'd been given authority by God. Uh, let me turn to uh, Numbers here real quick. That's right after Leviticus. That's the book you stop reading when you start reading from the beginning. Leviticus. Man, this is, this is hard. <laughs> uh, let me get there. Number 17. Come on. And verse number 10. And the Lord said unto Moses, Bring Aaron's rod again before the testimony. To be kept for a token against the rebels, and thou shalt quite take away their murmurings from me, that they die not. So it was a testimony that God had given Aaron authority, God had given Moses authority. Uh, And of course we saw throughout their wilderness wanderings, they often complained about the authority that God put in their lives in Moses and Aaron. Uh, But that that Aaron's rod was was a witness that God empowered them. God chose them. God put them in charge. Moses didn't want the job, you remember? <laughs> Nor would have I, right? He tried to get out of it, and God said, you're doing it, son. So, so it was a testimony that God had placed them in that position of authority. Uh, you know, I put down this, because we're going to kind of think about this witness of authority. Uh, God has given me a Christian authority. Now, that doesn't mean we're, we're you know, bossy and, you know, mm, listen to me, I, I, I am God's man. Okay, that's not what we're talking about. John 15, 16, Jesus says this, I have, I, You haven't chosen me. I have chosen you and ordained you. Why? To go forth and bear fruit. We have been given authority as a Christian by God to be his representative, uh, to preach the word, to be instant in season and out of season, to reprove, to rebuke, to exhort uh, with all long suffering. Okay? Uh, so we've been given that authority. The, the third thing here, let us see. Excuse me. Um, as Christians, I think we have to be careful. I don't think we should just say a few nice things about the Bible. Oh, it's a good book. Oh, it'll help you. You know, it'll change. It'll guide you. I think we should speak with authority from the Lord because we possess His written word. You see, here's here's the thing. This is not just a storybook. Okay, it's not just a collection of well thought out authors to put in. You know, this this is this is the Word of God. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. 
So if we have the power of God's word, and we've been given authority to represent the, the author of God's word, don't you think we should use it powerfully? I think we should. And that does, again, by the way, that doesn't mean we're mean or mean-spirited, but it means this. Listen, I'm not going to waver in what I say and what I do and what I believe because God's word doesn't change. Therefore, I won't change. The local church, letter D, is to be a witness to the word of God. Uh, the local church should not be, hey, you know, hey, pff, our church has awesome, you fill in the blank. Our church does these things really well. It ought to be, hey, y'all, come visit our church because we magnify the word of God. Because this is what we base everything on. Because this is how we make our decisions. Because this guides and dictates our personal lives as well as our corporate body of church life. Uh, the church ought to be a witness to the word of God. Acts chapter 1. Uh, ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. That's after salvation. And ye shall be what? Witnesses. And then it tells you where, you know, all over the world, be a witness. The church, just like the tabernacle and these things, in especially Aaron's rod, was a witness of the authority God gave. He's given us authority to represent him. Let's represent him well. Let's represent him well with power and love in the word of God. Uh, next week, we're going we're gonna to start getting actually... We're not going to be in yet. We're almost in to the tabernacle, okay? Uh, how to approach God. And we're going to look at the enclosure and the entrances. We're getting ready to step foot inside, okay? We're not quite there. <laughs> we're getting ready to step inside. But before we do, even the outside and the entrances into the Ark, or into the ark, to the ark of the Covenant, <laughs> into the tabernacle, have great significance for the child of God. And so that's where we're going to start next week. So we're just, you know, all this is kind of an introduction, getting us to the point. Now we're going to start to open the door and peek inside, okay? Uh, so that's where we'll be next week. And then, like I said, the next week we'll actually get into uh, the actual tabernacle. We'll actually open the doors and step foot inside, all right? And so you have to use your imagination when I say that, all right? So next week, how to approach God, Exodus 27, all right? We get all our blanks filled in tonight. Questions, comments, thoughts? Yes, sir. Yes, 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 I like that, yes. Be an obvious Christian, not an obnoxious Christian. Very good, very good. You will not reach the world walking around like this. <laughs> or like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, ma'am. I did not. Ah, in a tent. All right, cool, cool. How many of you remember that? Anybody besides Karen? <laughs> Nobody? Karen, you know what that means, right? <laughs> You're older than dirt. <laughs> Did you help them carry the tabernacle by chance? When they, okay, I was just, just, just I kidding. All right, let's pray, uh, and uh, and then we'll be we'll be dismissed. You want me to you want me to say something? Before I pray or after I pray? You don't care? It's in your mind. Hold on a second. It will in your mind. <laughs> All right. Hey, right after we're done, uh, I'm going to pray, okay? And uh, if you'd like to slip over to Fellowship Hall, we have a surprise for you. Uh, well, it's not me. I don't have a surprise for you. I'm just going to go and enjoy the surprise. But it's just cake. It's cake. We, had a, we have a birthday today. And I did not do this. The church did not. Don't get mad because I didn't do it for you because I didn't do it, all right? But uh, Miss Jean's having a birthday. She turned, what, 39 today, right? Amen. And uh, her family uh, got some cake and wanted to invite us all just to come over for a few minutes and eat some cake and fellowship and wish her a happy birthday. So Ben's was yesterday. That's right. Ben turned 15. What's that? But the cake is pink. That's all right. That's perfect for Ben. <laughs> hey, real men wear pink, right? <laughs> Amen. Anyways, slip over to Fellowship Paul, get a piece of cake, wish Miss Jean and Ben and anybody else have a birthday this week? We'll tell you have a birthday too, we might as well. But you did not. Oh, you were just saying, okay. He's just saying, yes, there's cake. That's all Roger was saying. <laughs> All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you this evening for your love and goodness. And Lord, we thank you even though we're, we're studying a very, very, very old uh, structure. 
uh, something that you used way back in Old Testament day. Uh, Lord, it still has some relevant truths for us as Christians today, and I pray that we'll be able to pull those out and, and use them in our lives to just encourage us in our relationship with you and your desire to be closer to us. And Father, we ask you as we uh, dismiss tonight, just help us to live for you this week and continue to point people to you. We ask you to uh, uh, bless the fellowship and the cake here in just a moment after the service. And uh, Lord, bless those that have had birthdays here. And uh, Lord, we ask you as well to bring us back on, on Friday as we have our Friday fellowship. And we pray that you'll be with that. And then, of course, the young people's activity on Saturday. Lord, such a busy weekend. And we just pray that you'll be in every aspect of it. Meet with us in uh, our Sunday services as well. Lord, prepare our hearts now, we pray. We thank you again for all that you do. Thank you for loving us and sending your son to die for us. Lord, may we live for you, we pray. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. God bless y'all. Shake a hand or two. Go get some cake.